Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Tim and we are glad that you are worshiping with us today. Welcome to the church scattered throughout Northeast Tarrant County and beyond. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. As we get started today, I just want to call your attention to our website, the online worship page. I want to call your attention to some resources there for your worship and your learning. There's a bulletin, there's children's resources, student resources, adult resources to help us with our worship and to go deeper in our learning. Additionally, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that page, you'll find a connection card form. It's a way for you to let us know that you're worshiping with us and it's a way for all of us to share prayer requests during this season. And now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Psalm 116. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. And so let us worship God. God is a God of love and a God of forgiveness. And so we can come before him and confess our sins, knowing that he is quick to forgive. 
if you would join me in the prayer of confession. Our Father, forgive us for thinking small thoughts of you and for ignoring your immensity and greatness. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we forget that you rule the nations and our small lives. Holy Spirit, we offend you in minimizing your power and squandering your gifts. We confess that our blindness to your glory has resulted in shallow confession, tepid conviction, and only mild repentance. Have mercy upon us and hear us as we continue to confess in the silence of our hearts. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that that is what we were, but we have been changed. We've been transformed. We've been redeemed. We've been made new. So here again, the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we are made new. And now let us continue in our worship. If you would join me in prayer. Gracious God, as we come before you today, we want to begin to, by simply recognizing the things that we are thankful for. Lord, too often we get so caught up in all the things we're worried about or all the things we want or all the things we need that we forget all of the blessings that you have showered upon us. And so as we come before you today, we simply begin by saying thank you. Thank you for the resources we have, the privileges we have, the opportunities we have. Thank you for the people and the communities that you've placed in our lives and placed us in. Thank you for our homes, our wealth, our health, our freedom, and all the other blessings you've showered upon us. Thank you for your Son who died for us and your Spirit who fills us. Lord, Today, we begin in our prayers by simply saying thank you. Thank you for your presence and thank you for your love. But Lord, we also come before you recognizing that we still need you to be with us and to help us. Lord, there are still too many who are hurting, who are angry, who are worried, who are grieving, and who need your faithful presence. And so, Lord, as we come before you today, we lift our prayers to you because we know that you are present with us and we know that you hear us and we know that you respond. And so we pray for those who are sick and those who are hurting and those who are dying. We pray for those who are lonely, those who are grieving, those who are afraid. We pray for those who are tired, those who are needy. And Lord, we continue in our prayers by lifting our prayers before you from the silence of our hearts at this time.
Lord God, be with our church, that we might be strengthened and empowered to do your work in your world. Help us to be a light in dark places, a calm presence in the face of the storm, and a help to those who are hurting. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness and love, your holiness and glory, and your presence. And we continue to pray today, and we use the words that Jesus taught those first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, let us continue in our worship. If you would join me in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we pray that you would speak to us today that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would grow us deeper in our maturity and closer to you. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Recently, I was listening to a podcast, and in it, the guest was talking about maturity and basically was saying that they could boil down all advice about maturity down to simply the idea of choosing the long term over the short term, the long term over the short term. Whether we're talking about delaying gratification or a longer time horizon or living intentionally, even Nietzsche's a long obedience in the same direction, doesn't it all simply boil down to choosing the long term over the short term? Now in that, you'll notice there's two different pieces of that. First, we're working toward goals and beliefs that are not easy or quick. And so first we recognize that good things take time. But then second, we are also choosing to not give in to the impulses and feelings and desires of the moment. We are recognizing that often our short-term wants go against our more meaningful aspirations. And so we learn that we have to be intentional about what we do instead of settling for what comes more naturally or quickly or easily, going along with the crowd. Uh, or in the alleged words of Einstein, the strongest force in the universe is compound interest. Interestingly, as an aside, apparently C.S. Lewis once noted that good and evil increase at compound interest. That's why the little decisions we make every day are of infinite importance. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe we could think about maturity being a function of choosing the long term over the short term this way. Uh, an infant wants what they want right now. It is urgent, it is important, it is immediate. And if they don't get what they want right now, they let you know how bad you are as a parent, often very loudly and vocally. Because they aren't good at waiting. They don't understand delayed gratification. They can't imagine that their wants aren't also their needs and aren't also urgent. And to be fair to babies, when you're that young, some of those things are pretty immediate and necessary. But of course, as we grow up, as we mature, we start to recognize that sometimes it's better to hold out for something better, even if it's also later. In fact, as we mature, we start to learn that almost 100% of the time, the better results come as we make decisions on a longer time horizon. And so we learn that if we want to become physically healthier, we need to make longer term decisions, eat healthy, exercise, even when we almost never want to do those things in the moment. And over time, that makes a huge difference. Uh, we want to be 
fiscally healthier. And so we choose long term over the short term. We choose to save instead of spend. We make wiser decisions instead of lazy decisions. We don't give in to the short term choice uh, of buying what we think will make us happy in the moment. You want to get better at a skill. And so you choose the long term. That's the skill I want to be better at. And so I will choose to spend time practicing and learning this skill, even though I don't want to practice the piano anymore right now. But I want to be better later. I'm choosing the long term desire to play piano more than simply the momentary desire to not practice. We want to have better relationships. Again, we choose the long term over the short term. And so we spend more time loving and being honest and being faithful and being sacrificial instead of simply doing what's easy or what can also be selfish. But here's what I find intriguing about all of this. Like last week, is that same rule uh, true of Christian maturity? How might our faith change if we choose the long term over the short term. Even more to the point, as Christians, are we to have an even longer time horizon, maybe stretching all the way to eternity? Let me back up for a moment. Last week, we began a new series looking at what we're calling the marks of Christian maturity. In other words, how do we know that we're becoming more mature, not only in our lives, but also in our faith? Additionally, we're using an analogy for all of this where maturity is comparable to being able to swim in the deep end of a pool. Immaturity being you're still in the shallow end of the pool or if you're young, you're also maybe in the kiddie pool. But the analogy was then also extended as we talked about there being different lanes in the pool of maturity. And so true maturity is a function of being able to swim in the deep end in several different lanes or categories of maturity. In other words, maturity isn't just binary, you're mature or you are not, but instead there are different areas in which we are to become more mature. And for those who are feeling like you're doing pretty well in one of these areas or another, oh yeah, I'm in the deep end in that area, I'm a strong swimmer in that area, I'm mature recognize that it's not hard to stretch this metaphor even just a little bit farther as we recognize that the goal isn't only to be able to swim in the deep end of the pool, but at that point we are able to then graduate to working on learning to swim better in maybe the ocean. Never forget that things get better and even more vast and amazing in the deeps. So anyway, in this series, we're looking at several marks of Christian maturity, namely knees for prayer, minds for Christ, mouths for sharing, feet for going, hands for serving, and hearts for God. And the goal is that we should have some experience, even proficiency, in every single one of these different areas as we grow toward Christian maturity. And today we begin by focusing on our knees. And so as we do, I would invite and encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 26. While you're turning there, I'd invite you to to take a moment to reflect on your personal views on prayer. Maybe it's just something we feel guilty about since we don't do it as much as we ought Maybe it's something that's powerful. Maybe it's just a waste of time. Maybe we see it as a quiet form of meditation. It's nice, it's helpful, but not always necessary. Maybe we see it as an obligation. Or maybe something else. What do you see prayer as being in your life? And yet it strikes me that having knees for prayer may be the most basic and yet also most important of the Christian marks of maturity. I can't think of any mature Christian that I know that doesn't have knees for prayer. And so as we read our passage today, let's look for Paul's view and practice of prayer. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 26. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will be, have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Amen. There are a couple things I want us to dig into, I want to call your attention to before we dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, first, this is a letter from Paul to his protege, Timothy, to the church in Philippi. Additionally, it's important that we remember that at this point, Paul has been arrested and is likely being persecuted in and by Rome. And then... If I were to have kept reading just a little bit farther, we also would have found out that the Philippians are also suffering some kind of persecution. So while everyone involved in this letter is going through a difficult time, we also notice that this letter has a strong current of deep joy just below the surface, which makes this a little bit more interesting and intriguing. And so, knowing that, now let's look back at Paul's view and understanding of prayer to see if we can't also figure out how Paul is able to have a long-term view despite his short-term persecutions. And so, let us start with Paul's practice of prayer. Then let's move on to his parts of prayer before finally looking at his posture in prayer. Again, practice, parts, and then posture. And remember, the goal is, what we're trying to do is develop better knees for prayer as we do the work of growing in Christian maturity. And so, the first thing we probably need to begin with is the most obvious, and that is simply that Paul prays. Uh, but of course, it's more than that. Because I'm struck by the beginning of verse 4, in all my prayers for all of you. To me, this sounds like a pattern a habit, a discipline. This is not that he prays for them when he remembers them. This is he remembers them when he's praying. But again, this sounds like a regular occurrence in Paul's life. Paul, as an example of Christian maturity, prays. He takes the time. He makes the time. He reshapes his time 
so that he can pray. This is important to Paul. Paul recognizes that this is important to God. Maybe even this is important to the Philippians. Maybe this should even be important to you and I. As I was thinking about this kind of regular prayer and maybe our lack of prayer, it came to my attention that that maybe some of our challenge happens as we start to try and pray for the first time. As we start to try and develop this habit, it doesn't always work right away. And, And as I was thinking about this, I was recognizing that maybe we could think about it this way. When I call up a friend who I haven't talked to in a year or three, I tend to speak in broad generalities. Here's how I've been doing over the last couple of months. Here's some summaries of what I've been wondering or thinking about over the last couple of years. Here's what's been happening to my family over the course of a long period of time. But then I've noticed I can't then call them up like a week later. Because I was painting with such a large brush, it would then feel very foreign to ask, how was your yesterday? Or here's what happened to me today. And so I don't call. I don't call for another, well, year or three. Whereas when I'm calling someone who I talk to regularly, I can talk about my day or something that just happened in the news or different thoughts or trivialities that are much more immediate and mundane. And then I can call them the next day and talk to them again. But the practice, the pattern, the frequency makes it easier or the lack thereof makes it harder. Maybe if we prayed more, we would find that it's not only easier, but we're more free to really share who we are and how we're doing. Be more honest in prayer. But it takes discipline. It takes practice. We have to continue to pray. But what do we say in our prayers? And as we look at this in Paul, I'm struck by the different parts that Paul prays. One of the remarkable parts of the way that Paul talks about prayer is in a language of thanksgiving and rejoicing. So often we view prayer as simply asking things of God. God, here's your list of things to do for me and for mine. But the reality is, maybe that's part of our problem with prayer. The reality is, we don't like being that helpless or demanding as we ask God for things. And yet Paul gives us a radically different picture of prayer. Prayers of gratitude, prayers of hopes, prayers of joy. I wonder how our prayers would be different if we spent time expressing our thanksgivings addressing our hopes, sharing our joys with God. I wonder if that would change the tenor of our prayers, but also the shape of our lives. Imagine how our lives would be different if we took two minutes, five minutes at the beginning of our day or at the end of our day simply to reflect and share our thanksgivings, our joys, our hopes to God. Remembering those we care about, lifting them before God. Again, not prayer concerns, not what we want God to do for us, just thanking God for the people in our lives. God, I'm thankful for and I pray that you would bless this person and that person. I'm so thankful for that person. Oh, and that person too. I wonder how that would change our view and experience of community. Now, again, remember our analogy of trying to swim in the deep, and that would be swimming more in the deep end of prayer, but it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? Because there's an ocean beyond that where we would be giving thanks and even expressing joy for those people in our lives that we don't like, who we don't agree with, maybe even those who we are against. But that may be a little bit more to bite off today than we can chew. I wonder how our experience of prayer would be different if we included more thanksgivings and joy. Of course, that's not to say that we can't or shouldn't ask, because of course that's a part of prayer as well. In fact, the very word pray comes from the Middle English to ask earnestly, or the Latin precari, which means to entreat. 
As Peter Grieg writes, prayer means many things to many people, but at its simplest and most immediate, it means asking God for help. It's a soldier begging for courage, a soccer fan at the final, a mother alone in a hospital chapel. You see, the reality is that there's something in us that knows that there are times when we simply need to humbly place our requests before God because there's no one else who can help us. There are times we simply need to cry out to God because there's no one else who can hear us. There are times we need to lift our wants and our needs and our hopes and our dreams to God because there's nothing else we can do. And in our passage, we find Paul also placing his prayers before God, making his requests known, asking the Almighty for what only God can do. Of course, the hard thing about asking is recognizing that God can answer with a no. Or sometimes God has to tell us to wait. And yet this is not a reason to avoid bringing our prayers before God. Because God wants us to ask. And who knows, maybe this is the prayer that then changes everything. And yet this is also where our posture in prayer may need to change. Because Paul shares an interesting posture as he also reflects on his own situation and that of the Philippians. You'll notice that Paul seems to trust God as he prays. Paul recognizes that his life is on the line, but more importantly, it's in God's hands, which is all that we can hope for anyway. And maybe more than any other aspect of prayer, this is the hard part, both recognizing that you aren't in charge and then being okay with that. Being okay with the idea that it's not all up to you, that the world doesn't revolve around you, and that you are not always in charge. And then having the humility to surrender to God's authority and will. Even when you don't understand it, even when you can't see it, even when it hurts. Remember, it was Jesus himself who asked for the cup to be taken away. And in essence, God said, no. But then it was also Jesus who then said, but not my will be done, but yours be done. That's what we're talking about. And that is why prayer can be so hard. Because I like prayer when it means that I have leverage on God, control over God. And when I can get God to do what I want, I like prayer when it means that I'm in charge. But prayer becomes harder as I remember that I'm not, as I remember that I follow God, and as I'm forced to work with God and for God and learn to trust God more. And yet maybe this is the posture that is missing sometimes in our prayers. And maybe this is the posture that moves us also toward maturity. Because remember, that's what we're talking about here. As we grow up in our faith, we both naturally and intentionally develop better knees for prayer. And this makes sense because part of what it means to grow in Christian maturity is that we are to become more like Jesus, growing closer to God being more filled with the Holy Spirit. But therefore, how could we not have more regular conversations with Him? And how could that not be a part of our transformation toward maturity? But it doesn't just happen. It takes work. It takes practice. It takes discipline so that we can grow into a people who are more mature. Nothing about prayer is challenging, but that doesn't make it safe. Nothing about prayer is complex, but that doesn't make it simple. Nothing about prayer is hard, but it's not easy. What's more, we know that prayer has the power to refocus, recenter, and reorder our chaotic lives, but that's not the reason we pray. And we know that prayer has the power to move mountains and bring healing, move the very hand of God, but that's not the reason we pray. Prayer brings us into the very presence of God, fills us with the Holy Spirit, makes us more like Jesus, but even that's not the reason we pray. We pray because God tells us to. 
invites us to, and then meets us as we do. And so prayer becomes a discipline that we work to grow into a habit so that we can grow into a people who are more mature in our faith and in our lives so that we might develop better needs for prayer. If you would join me as we pray. Lord God, we pray that you would help us, that you would help us develop better needs for prayer, that we might be a people who pray. Lord, you know all of our excuses you know all of our rationales. You know how often we are simply lazy. And yet we pray that you would invite us to pray. And we pray that we would make it important, that we would make it a discipline, that we would make it a habit, that we might grow deeper in our faith with you. Lord, as we pray, we ask that you would meet us there and that you would change us. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you for your presence. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. At this time, let us continue in our worship. move into a, a time of offering, hear these words from the book of Deuteronomy. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. We recognize that part of our duty as Christians is to respond to the blessings of God, a, a way for us to say thank you to God. And that's part of the reason why we make our offerings to God. We offer ourselves and our gifts to God as a way of returning to God a portion of what He has blessed us with, a, a way to say thank you. And so we give of our tithes and our offerings and our lives. If you would join me in prayer. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude that through us all people may know the riches of your love in the Word made flesh. Amen. At this time, let us give of our tithes and offerings. Yeah. 
Join me as we affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship.
Before we're done today, a couple quick announcements. First, there's a couple of things for your calendar. We're having uh, ordination and installation of officers on January 31st. Uh, an annual meeting will be on February 7th. There'll be a lot more information about that over the next couple of weeks. Additionally, we are continuing our pattern of worship where we have two worship gatherings, one at 8, one at 1045, and then we are worshiping in the 9 o'clock service in this room, uh, and then we'll also be online as well. Please join us as you are able. Remember to fill out a connection card before you're done, uh, and with that, receive the benediction. May you know the love of God. May you know the presence of Jesus Christ. May you know the joy of the Holy Spirit now and forever. God's blessings be upon you today and forever. Amen.